better than last time. Yes. A little cooler, though. Good evening, and welcome to the Chase Center at the Vermont Law School for this evening's first ever State's Attorney's Candidate Forum, co-hosted by the Vermont chapter of the ACLU, the ACLU of Vermont, and the VLS Center for Justice Reform. My name is Robert Sand, the director of the Center for Justice Reform. Let's acknowledge one thing right off the bat, particularly for the folks up here and your moderator. It's a little toasty in this space, so I don't think any of the voters would object if any of the candidates felt uh, more comfortable removing a suit jacket. And I will lead by example right now. <laughs> I'm not proud. The state's attorney is the chief elected prosecutor in each county of Vermont elected to a four-year term. Unlike in some jurisdictions, the state's attorney in Vermont has general jurisdiction over almost every crime, from noise in the nighttime to homicide. It is an awesome job with awesome responsibilities. Thank you to all the candidates for entering the fray. We extended invitations to all of the candidates in contested elections as indicated by the filings with the Vermont Secretary of State's office. Of those 11 candidates, six of them are here with us this evening. So in a moment, I will go over the ground rules for our discussion, but before I do that, I'd like to introduce to you someone who truly understands what it means to have an awesome job and awesome responsibilities, the President and Dean of Vermont Law School, Thomas McHenry. Bobby, thank you very, very much. And um, welcome all of you. Welcome all of you who are online. Thank you very much to our candidates for being here. It's a real treat. As I told a couple of you earlier on, we love the opportunity to host events of this kind. It's exactly why Vermont Law School is here. We're the only law school in Vermont. We think of ourselves as Vermont's law school, although some people think we're part of UVM, which we work very closely with. Uh, we don't get any money from the state except for our state law library support. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're really delighted to be able to welcome you today and, and, and have this uh, uh, debate. Uh, I want to mention just a, a few things beforehand and then, uh, and then step down and turn, turn it back over to Bobby. The first is I want to recognize Julie Kalish, who is in the back there in white. She's the president of the ACLU um, and, and a Vermont Law School graduate. So we're delighted to have her here. Uh, I will point out that we have two of the five members of the Vermont Supreme Court are Vermont Law School graduates. I'm hoping for a majority before I step down as dean. Um, uh, I want to uh, just uh, highlight uh, some wonderful news at Vermont Law School, which is that we currently have more than 190 deposits for our entering class of JD students. We have 50 master's students scheduled to come. Uh, Bobby, how many in the restorative justice master's program? 20 new master's. We have 20 new master's students on top of that in restorative justice, a number of them doing that fully online, some residential, some hybrid uh, LLM students. and. Uh, more than 100 online students. That is an increase uh, of uh, double digits for the last three years in our entering class. Somewhat reflective of what's going on in law schools. The number of people going to law school is picking up again, uh, but it's picking up more quickly at Vermont Law School, and we're really uh, thrilled about that, and we'll be uh, welcoming those <coughs> students on the uh, 20th of August for our orientation. I also want to mention uh, something that uh, Professor Bobby Sand knows so much about which is our new master's degree in restorative justice. We already offer three master's degrees at Vermont Law School, one in environmental law, one in energy law, one in agriculture law, uh, but we will now be offering a master's of arts in restorative justice, which comes with the wonderful nickname of Marge. So we have a Merle, a Melp, a Mafalp, and a Marge. 
uh, and that will be starting this fall, and we're absolutely thrilled about that. And I think mostly thrilled about the opportunity to be engaged with restorative justice, and some of the questions tonight may be directed to ways in which justice can be more evenly and better administered in Vermont. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say except welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Come back often. Uh, and I think I'm going to introduce James Lyle now. James is the executive director of the ACLU of Vermont. He is a Middlebury College graduate. Uh, he was formerly a staff attorney for the ACLU in Arizona. He's come back to his college area. He's only an hour from Middlebury. And we're thrilled to have you here. James, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just, I, first I want to thank Dean McHenry and Vermont Law School for hosting the event. Um, I want to thank Professor Sand and everyone at the Center for Justice Reform for organizing this event and co-sponsoring it. Um, I'd like to thank the candidates uh, who are here tonight, all of whom have traveled um, a great distance to be here. Um, I want to thank the Vermonters uh, from across the state who've submitted questions for the candidates this evening. Um, and I want to thank everybody here in attendance tonight and, and following online. Thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm just going to say a few quick words and give a little bit of context about why we're here tonight and why this forum is so important. Um, so a few facts. Uh, Vermont's prison population has doubled over the past two decades. It is now stands at approximately 1,700 people. Uh, of those, roughly 250 are incarcerated out of state. Uh, Vermont's per capita incarceration rate is actually the third highest among neighboring New England states and almost triple that of our neighbors to the north in Canada. Uh, so although it's a small state and a relatively small prison population, the, the rate uh, is, is high. Uh, in recent years, uh, as the result of some changes in policy, we've seen a decrease in Vermont's prison population, we've turned a corner. Um, and it's important to note that that has happened without any adverse impact on public safety. As Vermont has begun to decarcerate, uh, Vermont remains one of the safest states in the nation. Still many issues remain. Uh, the Department of Corrections alone spends well over 140 million taxpayer dollars per year. As was just reported, Vermont has the second highest per inmate health care costs in the country. Vermont's justice system also has some of the most pronounced racial disparities in the country. <clears throat> and as in many other states, Vermont's prisons house predominantly low-income people, many who suffer from mental health issues and many who suffer from addiction. One other fact, um, most Vermonters want to see these trends change. Recent polling indicates that two-thirds of Vermonters want to see Vermont reduce its prison population further and increase the use of alternatives to incarceration. So that's where we are now, and obviously people can and do disagree about whether the current system is working, whether we need to rethink our criminal justice policies, and if so, what else we need to be doing, uh, or what else we need to do differently. Uh, and that's largely why we're here tonight, of course, but we're also here tonight um, because when it comes to these critical issues facing Vermont communities, the work of elected state's attorneys is critical. And at the same time, that work is not well understood by many voters. And that needs to change. So the ACLU is proud to co-sponsor this event uh, with the Center for Justice Reform and to invite the candidates to say in their own words, to speak to their constituents, to engage with their constituents and make the case for why they should be elected based on their ideas, qualifications, and experience. Um, it is this kind of engagement and this kind of dialogue uh, that is essential to the health of our elections and to our democracy. Uh, and frankly, we're going to need much more of it if we're going to tackle and solve the challenges that we all face together. So I want to thank you again, everybody, for coming. and looking forward to a lively discussion. few more introductory remarks, I promise you will all have a chance to talk. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Duff, Mr. Lyle, contacted me and asked if the Center for Justice Reform wanted to be a co-host, I said, absolutely. And then he said, and how would you like to be the moderator? And I paused a little bit and I said, uh, happy to do that. 
on one condition that I have complete discretion over the questions that get asked, and he didn't skip a beat. He said absolutely. Uh, having said that, we solicited questions from a very broad audience. I know that ACLU of Vermont reached out to its membership throughout the state. Uh, I reached out to prosecutors and defenders in Vermont. I reached out to state employees at the Department of Corrections, the Department of Children and Families, uh, community mental health agencies, and clients of those various organizations, and students, faculty, staff at Vermont Law School. I should tell our audience that uh, other than the very first question, which will be an opportunity for the candidates to introduce themselves, the candidates have not heard the questions that they will be asked this evening. So here's the format. Some of the questions that I will pose will be to specific individuals. We have three candidates from one county. There will be some Lamoille County specific questions. Others of the questions will be posed to the, uh, the other candidates, and uh, depending upon the question, I may ask uh, other folks if they wish to weigh in. We are on a fairly uh, tight timetable, notwithstanding the long introductions. So in a moment, when you do your uh, opening remarks, we're going to limit you to three minutes. Subsequent questions, will uh, you'll have two minutes. You will get a 30 minute, uh, I'm sorry, 30 second <laughs> warning, and then a time indication. And our timekeeper this evening is Eva Ryan, and she will hold up a card that says 30 seconds and one that says time, and you do not want to get her mad. Uh, may I, by a nod of the head, show all of your uh, assent to trying to stay within that time frame and to an understanding that I'm going to cut you off if you start running over? Yes. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat that as a not head nod from all of you. Uh, tonight's event is being live streamed on both Vermont Law School's website and Facebook page. Viewers can watch the event uh, live by going to vermontlaw.edu backslash live or facebook.com backslash vermontlaw. Uh, the Facebook stream is also being closed captioned. And in the age of the internet, uh, this evening's discussion will also be available for viewing in perpetuity, in perpetuity here, hereafter. I want to thank the ACLU of Vermont for co-hosting this event. They have a sign-up sheet on the front table if you're interested in learning more about their activities. If you're interested in joining a criminal justice newsletter, there's a sign-up sheet is there as well. I want to uh, acknowledge Nico Amador, who's here, the community organizer from the ACLU. And I'll just mention that Nico hosted a number of really interesting webinars over the past year. If you sign up, you'll get news about them. It was a fascinating way to connect people all over the state on a, uh, a variety of topics, uh, re really informative. Uh, Martina and all the folks at Fitzvoke provided the food. We don't want to leave any food behind. Bring it with you at the end of the evening if there is any. Jeff Knudsen set up with his crew for buildings and grounds. Emily Potts, Bill Bond, and Dylan Walsh are our IT tech and live stream experts. Karen Henderson did the graphics work for our poster, and Aaron Webster Chambers has uh, kept me in line. So, who's here this evening? Starting at the far end, from Bennington County, Arnie Gottlieb. Uh, Mr. Gottlieb is challenging the incumbent in a primary. Working closer to me, Amy Davis from Essex County. Ms. Davis is challenging the incumbent in a primary. Next is Paul Finnerty from Lamoille County. Mr. Finnerty is the incumbent state's attorney seeking re-election. Next is Todd Shove. Mr. Shove is challenging Mr. Finnerty in the primary. Next is Betsy Anderson. Ms. Anderson will face the winner of the Paul Finnerty Todd Shove primary in the general election. And closest to me is Garrett Cornelius, who from Orleans County. Mr. Cornelius is challenging the incumbent in the general election. And with that, I would ask, and I'll start at the far end, working closest to me, I would ask each of you to, in three minutes or less, feel no compulsion to use the full three minutes, to introduce yourself and, as prosecutors do, make your opening statement. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Arnie Gottlieb, and I'm running for state's attorney for Bennington County. And I, too, want to thank Professor Sand, the Center for Justice uh, Reform at uh, Vermont Law School, and the ACLU of Vermont for organizing and presenting this event. I believe that the more information uh, that voters have available about the candidates, uh, the better informed they are, and they become wiser and make better decisions at the ballot box. And on that note, I first of all want to apologize uh, to the folks of Bennington County uh, because they will not be receiving full benefits of this wonderful event uh, because my opponent has elected not to attend this evening and thus depriving them of open and honest airing of the crucial differences that exist between us. So with that being said, let me tell you why I am running. I believe that, especially in Bennington County, there is a crucial need in the culture and the philosophy of that office. I believe that the citizens of Bennington County want a state's attorney that will institute common sense criminal justice reforms that ac accurately reflect the times. Uh, it is consistent with, as mentioned earlier, national surveys uh, that state that virtually all Americans believe that criminal justice reforms are necessary. For too long, the Bennington County State's Attorney's Office has been run under what I believe to be a decades-old philosophy of simply filing charges and sending folks to prison. It fails to recognize the realities uh, of the county. We have a crisis, and it's certainly no secret. Uh, we have an opiate crisis in this state, and Bennington County is certainly no different. And I will be taking this on as uh, perhaps one of my biggest challenges. People obviously commit crimes uh, to raise money to support their habit. They tear apart, it tears apart families. And the issues are very complex and nuanced. Uh, and I view addiction as a medical issue, not a criminal issue. It involves issues of prevention and treatment. Agencies, families, law enforcement, and the court system must all coordinate their efforts. This is why I'm in favor of establishing a drug court, diversion programs, and other alternative forms of sentencing that address these issues. It's an example, I believe, of how drug courts can be of a benefit uh, for defense counsel, the judges, law enforcement, and not just the state's attorney who determines who is going to be diverted. This is one example, I believe, of how my office, if elected, will institute contemporary criminal justice reforms in Bennington County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gottlieb. Ms. Davis. Um. Thank you to Vermont Law School and the ACLU for hosting us tonight. I think that this is a wonderful idea to get information out about the, the various candidates who are running, and I just wish that all 11 of us in contested elections were here. Um, I, my name is Amy Davis. I am a 2015 graduate of Vermont Law School. Um, I sat for the bar exam that year, passed my first shot, and found myself up in the Northeast Kingdom working with Deborah Bucknam, who ran for Attorney General two years ago. Um, two years into my practice, she made me a partner at Bucknam Black Davis, and that's where I currently practice. Over the last two years, I have spent the bulk of my time working not only uh, with those who have been charged with crimes in Orleans and Caledonia counties, but I have also worked on behalf of children and their parents who have state involvement in Essex, Caledonia, Orleans, and Lamoille counties. The state's attorney is not limited just to those, pro just to prosecuting those who have committed crimes, but also working on behalf of children and their families who warrant state intervention. I am running for this position because in the first year that I held a contract in Essex County, I did not take a single juvenile case out of that county. Cases are not being investigated. They are not being brought. There is a severe lack of resources in Essex County, unlike anywhere else in the state. If somebody wants to participate in a treatment program, they have to drive over an hour to get to said program. So those that are seeking help just don't have the availability to do it. My opponent 
collects a regular paycheck from the state. The state pays to keep his uh, private law firm running. He spends five days a week in Montpelier lobbying on behalf of private interests when the legislature is in session. The state pays for his support staff, including a victim advocate who does not go to court with the victims, and essentially re-victimizes every victim and putting them through this process yet again. Cases aren't being prosecuted the way that they should. Essex County has hired somebody who does not want to do this job, who doesn't have the energy to do this job. Essex County can and must do better. I get a lot of questions about why are you getting into politics? And I go, well, I didn't want to, but that's the only way to get this job. And I am asking for the support of people of Essex County so that I can put my office in Essex County so that people can have access to their elected representative. I wanna work with law enforcement to combat the opioid epidemic by focusing both on treatment and prevention. And I wanna bring closure to victims of violent crimes and provide safe and stable homes for children. So that's why I'm running for this position and I appreciate your votes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Mr. Finnerty. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Finnerty and I am a career prosecutor I've been involved in the criminal justice system now for 36 years, pretty much since I graduated from this esteemed institution in 1982. And I was happy to, uh, actually I'm thrilled. I, I believe that restorative justice is the wave of the future. And I am absolutely thrilled to see Professor Sands uh, moving forward and creating a, a restorative justice track here at Vermont Law School. I think that's great. Um, I was thinking on the way down about my experiences here in South Royalton. I used to live over there in the Whitcomb House, which is where the, I think the legal writing program is now. Um, a short walk away. You can start with a hot cup of coffee and it would still be hot when you got over here, which is great. Uh, I worked on, on the, I was a member of the South Royalton Fire Department. And one of my proudest memories was, I think in my, the beginning of my third year, I painted a side of a house on a small dairy farm in uh, East Randolph and I got paid with 45 pounds of pig. And that was just the, the best year ever. <laughs> I had ham and bacon and sausage and pork chops and life was good. So I was, um, I ran for Lamont County State's Attorney four years ago. I was elected with bipartisan support. I received 99.16% of the vote. Uh, before that, I worked for seven years as a deputy in Chittenden County with T.J. Donovan. Before that, I worked as a deputy in Washington County for 11 years. Uh, before that, I worked in private practice in Lamoille County. I had a criminal defense uh, contract with the uh, Defender General. And before that, I started my career, well, I, before that I worked as a prosecutor in Springfield, Massachusetts uh, for seven years. And before that, I worked as a prosecutor uh, in the National Parks. I prosecuted my first case in, I think, 1982 in front of a federal magistrate in Sequoia National Park. So, um, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been practicing in Vermont since 1992. Uh, I think I have a pretty good sense of the way the system works. You know, things change over time. It's always helpful to know how things used to be, how they are today, and where they're going in the future. I think that uh, that pertains to restorative justice and alternative uh, resolutions for criminal cases as well. What I've done in Lamoille County in the last four years is to uh, look at each case individually, try to get a sense of the history of the person, where they are in their life, and make the right decision, the right charging decision, uh, the right recommendation for sentencing, the right bail recommendation. And I'm, I'm happy that the legislature has given us more tools to um, decarcerate the population, uh, bail reform, um, pretrial monitors, uh, expanding the diversion program. Uh, those are all huge things. And we're fortunate in Lamoille County because we have probably the most successful restorative center of any county in the state. And I look forward to having the opportunity to make some further steps towards creating a more restorative oriented criminal justice system in Lamoille County because I think that's the wave of the future. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Finnerty. <clears throat> Mr. Chauvin. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be here. My name is Todd Chauve, and I'm running for state's attorney in Lamoille County. Um, I've been privileged to have been able to call Wilmoa County my home for the last 14 years. Uh, I've raised both of my children there. Uh, we have what I think is one of the last one-room schoolhouses in the state of Vermont. Both of my kids went through there and that's been a great experience. Um, I uh, 
<clears throat> was admitted to the bar um, in 2005. I started working for Joel Page, who was the state's attorney there, uh, doing my clerkship to, to be admitted to the bar. Um, I then took on a uh, Violence Against Women's Act uh, domestic violence prosecution position in that office. Uh, and I worked for Joel for almost 10 years as a, as a deputy state's attorney. Um, that was a wonderful experience. I learned a great deal about Memorial County, about being a prosecutor, uh, about the services that are available for uh, victims of domestic and sexual violence uh, in the county. Um, I then briefly went into private practice for uh, a year with uh, Betsy Anderson's uh, uncle, Peter Anderson, and that was a great experience. We did uh, strictly civil litigation. Um, but I really didn't feel like that was where I wanted to be. And then there was an opportunity that came up in uh, Orleans County to, to be a deputy state's attorney, and so I went up there for uh, a little over two years. Um, I would like to be able to come back to Lamoille County and bring my experience and my knowledge as a prosecutor uh, and apply it to the community in which I live and raise my family. Um, I've been encouraged from our local law enforcement uh, agencies to come back and do that. Um, generally speaking, they don't at this time feel like their work is being valued in the county uh, and they would like to see a change in prosecutors. And so this is my opportunity and that's why I'm running for state's attorney. Thank you, Mr. So. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Anderson, but everybody calls me Betsy. I'm running for Lamoille County state's attorney. With your help, we can ensure that criminals are held accountable, there's justice for crime victims, and the most vulnerable amongst us are protected. I want to tell you a little about myself. I was born in Stowe, and my family's roots in Stowe run deep. My paternal grandparents, Rudy and Helen Anderson, were longtime residents of Stowe. My uncle Peter Anderson has been practicing law in Lamoille County for the past 25 years, and my father was a deputy Lamoille state's attorney in the 1980s. So I'm not a candidate who seeks selection in an area where I don't live or don't have any local connections. To me, Lamoille County is going to be more than just a place to work. It's my home and where I'm going to raise my family. I grew up in Derby and Chittenden County. I graduated in the top 10% of my class at Rice Memorial High School. I then went to James Madison University in Virginia where I graduated cum laude. I attended St. John's School of Law in New York. There I was editor-in-chief of the American Bankruptcy Institute Law Journal. After graduating law school, I began my career as a prosecutor at the Nassau County District Attorney's Office. I was an assistant district attorney there for five and a half years. I began handling misdemeanor case loads. I handled uh, 200 to 300 uh, misdemeanor cases on a daily basis uh, while I was at the DA's office. I was then promoted to handle felonies. I handled general felonies. I did that for about a year and a half. And then I was asked to join the Street Narcotics and Gangs Unit where I took on violent offenses and drug trafficking. I was also a member of the gang unit where I handled the prosecution of MS-13 and 18th Street gang members. I returned to Vermont two years ago. Uh, me and my husband moved back. We just welcomed our first son, Charlie, in April. And uh, like I said, we live in Stowe. I am now currently at the Attorney General's office in their criminal division. I work there as a prosecutor. I handle a wide variety of cases. I can handle, um, I handle homicides, child uh, crimes against children, uh, domestic violence cases, sexual assaults, uh, basically everything. I also, review, I also review police misconduct cases and cases that involve officer shootings. I'm running for state's attorney to make the county we love safer. I'm running for state's attorney in Lamoille County because we deserve a county prosecutor that will ensure those who violate the law will face justice that is not delayed, denied, or dismissed. I'm running because we deserve a state's attorney that will not only be tough on crime, but smart on crime. And I'm running because we deserve a state's attorney who will view law enforcement as a partner partners with the goals of making the county we love safer and to represent responsive to the people we serve. If I'm elected state's attorney, I can promise you that each and every day I will earn the trust of your vote. I will fight tirelessly for justice in a fair, impartial, and unbiased manner. I will be tough but fair. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Cornelius. Hello, I'm Garrett Cornelius. I'm running as an independent in Orleans County this year and will appear on the ballot in the general election in November. 
I'm a Northeast Kingdom native and I've lived in the Northeast Kingdom my entire life. I understand the values that the people hold in Orleans County. I am not a lawyer, um, nor do I aspire to be one, but I'm energetic and excited to show the voters in Orleans County that I can fulfill the duties and obligations of a state's attorney better than a lawyer can. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So from here on out, I'm gonna ask that you confine your remarks to two minutes. And this question I'm gonna ask of the Lamoille County candidates, and maybe Ms. Anderson, I'll start with you and then we can go down the line. Sure. Um, so there are criminal justice problems and issues that are universal to Vermont, and then there are some that might be place or county specific. Uh, my question is, what are the most pressing criminal justice problems in Lamoille County, and what do you intend to do to address those problems as state's attorney? Um, I think one of the most uh, pressing problems in Lamoille County is the opiate problem. I think that Lamoille County, just as other counties in the state, are dealing with um, with opiate addicts and the crimes that are committed uh, because of individuals who are addicted to opiates. I think the way to handle this problem is to uh, provide treatment to those who want treatment and ensure that they're feel, they feel supported during the treatment process. Uh, right now, the Moyle County has a great diversion program. Uh, they also have the TAMRAC program, which is another branch of diversion, all which deal with individuals uh, who have committed crimes. Uh, and if you're uh, committed a drug crime, you can also go through those programs. And if I was state's, elected like state's attorney, I would continue to use those programs. Uh, one program that the Moyle County doesn't have that other counties have is a drug treatment court. I think that um, it's seemingly unfair that if you commit a drug crime in Barrie, but uh, you have access to treatment court, and then if you do it in Morrisville, you don't. And so I think that's a really important uh, thing, I, a tool I'd like to bring to the county. It's a little bit different than diversion in that you can deal with people that uh, maybe have a bigger criminal history than those that enter into diversion. Um, and it, they usually tend to, in treatment court, they tend to plead up front to either um, the misdemeanor or felony they're charged with, and then if they're successful, it's dismissed, and there's a great support group that work with those individuals. So I see that um, the opiate crisis is a crisis Lamoille County is dealing with, and I think treatment court and continuing the programs that we have would be most helpful. Thank you very much. Mr. Schill. Um, I think probably the, the most uh, prevalent issue in Lamoille County in terms of a crime that's being committed is the operation of a motor vehicle under the influence of alcohol. And I think what we're going to see is uh, more and more operation of a motor vehicle under some other kind of a drug. Um, specifically, I, th I share the same concerns about the opiates. Um, I, I think they're just going to become more and more prevalent all the time. Um, I've had the privilege of participating in completing a drug rec recognition expert school, which is a two-week program for law enforcement officers uh, where they uh, get schooled in identifying all of the physiological changes in an individual's body as a result of taking drugs and the effects of drugs on the body. Um, we then spent three days out in Phoenix, Arizona, doing evaluations of people within the criminal, uh, in, in the, within the prison systems who were known to be on drugs. Um, but the fact of the matter is there aren't enough of those experts out there that are certified in law enforcement. So I would like to see more of those police officers getting certified. Um, but I think that's really one of the biggest issues in Lamoille County is, is the operation and the drugs. Um, the second biggest issue, which is close to me because I was a domestic violence prosecutor, is domestic violence. Um, I think the victims in Lamoille County, because of its rural nature, are uh, fairly isolated. Uh, it can be difficult for them to reach out and get uh, services um, to, to get help with their situations. Um, and they're also oftentimes, because of their iso isolation, they feel like they really can't come forward. And so being able to uh, provide good investigations by police officers um, and you know, backup services to those individuals so that they feel safe is very important. Thank you. Mr. Finnerty. Well, what's, <clears throat> what's great about working in Lamoille County is the strength of the service network 
that exists and how well people work together. So the single largest offense that's charged in, in Lamoille County is driving under the influence of alcohol, the second is driving with suspended license, and the third is misdemeanor domestic assaults. So, <clears throat> you know, it's easy to sit up here and say, oh, you know, there's an opiate crisis in Lamoille County and we're gonna crack down on the people that are trafficking, but Lamoille County has treatment on demand for people that are addicted to opiates that want to get into treatment. And what we do in court using the pretrial monitor program, people come into court, they obviously have a substance abuse issue. We ask the court to order them to meet with the pretrial monitor, to have an assessment and a screening, and to participate in any treatment recommendations that are made. So we have people coming in the front door of the courthouse and leaving and starting treatment right away. We can get people into beds at Valley Vista, at the Balboa Retreat. Uh, so we're providing immediate treatment for people that are in need of treatment. We can help people get insurance that don't have insurance to pay for it and just help people move in the right direction. So <clears throat> what we have in, in Lamoille County is a large number of people that are participating in the medication assisted treatment program. And it's been very successful. It allows people to live and work in the community, to pay their taxes, to spend time with their families, and that's, that's great. What I would like to, what I'm waiting to see is a report that's coming from the Supreme Court, I believe, or the legislature on the feasibility of having a family treatment court in the state of Vermont, where you can take people that have opiate issues, that are having a hard time raising their families or, or dealing with their kids because of their addiction issues, and bringing all those issues, instead of in the criminal forum, but bringing them into the family court so you can talk about what the kids need, what the parents need, and just provide that sort of a, a framework for moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Finnerty. We, we've had requests from a few folks in the back of the room for a little more volume, so I'm hoping the candidates could maybe either scoot your mics in just a bit or lean in a little bit more. So I'm gonna uh, direct this question to the non-Lamoyle candidates. Yeah. Uh, and let me start again at, at the far end with Mr. Gottlieb, but I'll then go to Ms. Davis and then Mr. Cornelius. Um, in Vermont, we are proud of our communities, and yet we continue to send offenders out of state. Do you support the use of out-of-state correctional facilities? And if not, what steps do you plan to take to support reducing the prison population and to ensure that Vermonters who need to be incarcerated are incarcerated in Vermont? Sure. Um, yes, Vermont uh, does not get a free pass when it comes to incarcerating folks. And as you alluded to, uh, we are sending folks to other states, private uh, companies, and there, it's my understanding there is also currently in the legislature uh, discussions about another 900 plus bed facility. Uh, and Bennington County, quite frankly, is the biggest offender. Uh, Bennington County itself uh, sends more people per capita uh, than any other county and incarcerates twice the state average per capita. So it is a specific issue in our county. Uh, there are a number of ways to deal with it. Um, the first one, of course, is diversion, uh, drug treatment, uh, other alternative formats, which will lessen, uh, that, that's the short term, that, that will lessen the, uh, the population. The more longer term issue is the development of a drug court, which we do not have, and, and I think the, uh, the citizens of Bennington County truly want it uh, based upon my discussions with them. So the establishment of the drug court in the longer term, as well as hopefully uh, lobbying legislators, I would hope that all state's attorneys in this state could band together and lobby the legislatures to shift and added, change the attitude from incarcerating so many people at thirty to $60,000 a year, depending upon what statistics you want to look at, and move that money for treatment and alternative programs. If you just took a fraction of that prison budget, you would do wonders. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Um, the short answer is no, I don't support 
uh, sending inmates out of state. I think that sending inmates out of state just has infinite collateral consequences that we can't always predict. Uh, for instance, if inmates are st sent out of state, um, it reduces their ability to interact with their children. Um, depending on how long they're gone, they may lose that relationship with their children. And, and I know I, I get some people that say, well, you know, they committed a, a crime, and that's one of, you know, that's just one of the things that goes along with that, and you know, how you have to pay a price in order for that to happen. But, you know, the child didn't commit the crime, and the child is the one that's being punished with it, who, who may want to have a relationship with their parent that is uh, currently out of state. I think that we need to look at all the various types of supervised release so that an offender can be uh, rehabilitated into the community. Sometimes probation is appropriate, sometimes a home confinement or home detention might be more appropriate. Um, sometimes the individual uh, needs strict supervision and that should be left up to the Department of Corrections to supervise that individual. One of the problems that we have in the Northeast Kingdom is that we currently, uh, that we uh, about a year or two years ago, we closed the work camp in St. Johnsbury so that there were people that were earning day-for-day -day credit so that they could go to the work camp and earn a day off the other end of their sentence and then um, reintegrate into the community. We closed that work camp um, and we did it for financial reasons um, to save money and I'm all about saving money but now what's happening is that these inmates are sitting in prison, they're waiting to max out and then once they max out they go right back into the community without the necessary rehabilitation to protect the community and to prevent them from reoffending. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Mr. Cornelius. The short answer is that I absolutely do not support the building of a new prison that would house 900 plus extra inmates. Um, what can we do to reduce the prison population and keep these inmates in Vermont? I feel that um, with the Commissioner of Corrections and, and the Governor really taking a hold of this issue. I would agree with uh, Mr. Gottlieb that the only real way is for state's attorneys to push back in the legislature and to join, join together and lobby against these efforts. We can't stand uh, to tolerate a prison like this to be built and to be used. Um, one thing that we absolutely have to be doing is reaching to the facilities and the laws that we already have. Every county is required by law to have a restorative justice center, and I know that as far as my county in Orleans is concerned, it's practically a ghost town. We need to be employing these facilities and using these laws at the earliest, at the earliest moment in each of these cases, um, including serious cases. Restorative justice is not just about the offender, it's about the victim and the community as a whole. So even for more serious crimes, implementing the, implementing the principles of restorative justice could go a long way in making our community and our victims whole. Um, that's, that's primarily how, how we're going to reduce the prison population, is by finally observing the laws that are already in place. We seem to be living in a world where we have modern laws, but we're still living with archaic practices. It's time that we have to turn around and start reaching to the facilities and the laws that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Feel no compulsion whatsoever, but if any or all of the Lamoille folks want to weigh in and share maybe no more than a minute's worth of remarks on the issue about out-of-state prisons, this would be an <clears throat> opportune time, but as I said, don't feel any pressure to do so. I, I think that there are, you know, there are certainly, we're fortunate in Vermont because we don't have that many truly evil person, people who are sociopaths in the state, um, but there are some. And most of the people who commit crimes in Vermont are from Vermont, and it comes from poor decision making at a particular point in time in their life. And when everyone's sentence is over, they come back to Vermont because that's where they live and that's where the family is. And you know, my question is, what kind of person do we want to see come back at the end of their sentence? But I think there are some people that need to be incarcerated, need to be incapacitated in order to protect society, but there are also people who you know, the risk of recidivism declines as prisoners age and their health care costs go up. And I think uh, we're approaching a 
sort of a tipping point in the legislature where we may see a compassionate furlough program make it through the legislature. It will allow some people that are, you know, in their 70s or 80s or serving long sentences who be able to be released to come back to their community and, you know, spend the rest of their years here instead of in some out-of-state facility. So that's my thought. Thank you. Mr. Schultz? I would like to see uh, a change where there are not as many prisoners being sent out of the state of Vermont. Uh, I'm assuming that the reason that that's happening is because the Department of Corrections uh, lacks the resources to be able to accommodate everybody within the state. Um, that being said, I also agree with Ms. Davis about the collateral consequences. I mean, it's devastating to a family to have somebody sent out of state. They can't visit with their um, spouses or their children or their partners. Um, and that can have long-term effects on the family dynamics. And I think that's, as Ms. Davis indicated, that's unfair to the kids uh, because they didn't commit the crime. Uh, the other point is, is that I'm not sure if I understand why we're paying money for other states to be housing our prisoners when we might be able to be uh, employing people right here in the state of Vermont, working within the Department of Corrections um, to be able to supervise those people that really require supervision within a correctional facility. Thank you. Briefly, I just wanted uh, to note that the individuals that are sent, are sent out state have usually committed very violent crimes and are serving long-term sentences out of state. Um, so we're not dealing with an individual that's been arrested for possession or low-level types of crimes. That being said, I still do think that um, it would be better to have those individuals in the state. I understand that it's a resource issue and it's going to take a lot of different groups coming together to figure out how to bring those individuals back. Um, and I think it'll cost a lot of money as well, but I think that it should happen. I was going to ask this question to the non lamoyal candidates, but given uh, the importance of all these questions, and in many respects having just a few minutes to answer, I recognize is, is somewhat unfair. But Mr. Cornelius, I'll start with you and go down the line. And of course, if you want to pass, feel free to do that. But the Vermont State Police has launched a very important effort to look at explicit and implicit bias within uh, their department. Do you accept that there is a risk or reality of racial bias on the part of prosecutors? And if so, what steps will you undertake to address racial and other biases within your office? I take uh, racial biases very seriously. Um, it's not enough for state's attorneys to be colorblind. We have to be sensitive to people's racial differences and people's differences in general. Um, I believe that this is a wonderful thing. Any accountability um, that we can raise for law enforcement is a good thing, especially in areas like this. We do have a racial bias problem even here in Vermont, and I don't believe that Orleans County is, is an example where this is an acute problem. I think that we have other problems. But if a case were to land on my desk where there wasn't any evidence of probable cause for a charge, but there was evidence of racial bias, I would take that matter very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. I think that um, implicit bias, as we've learned through studies, is a very real thing and can affect every, everybody, uh, not just police, but I think um, it likely could affect prosecutors as well. Um, I don't think it would be such a bad idea if prosecutors wanted to, to attend the implicit and explicit bias training that state police puts on. I think that would only be helpful to everyone. Um, I can tell you if I was elected state's attorney in Lamoille County, I would take a reasonable historical review of the uh, cases prosecuted by the office to determine if minority defendants were treated disparately at the prosecution stage. I'd also work with law enforcement and other participants in the criminal justice system to ad address those, if any, racial disparity issues that may exist. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. Uh, as the state's attorney, your uh, responsibility is to look at every single case uh, very closely in, term, in making the determination of whether or not there's probable cause. Um, if 
there appears to be any bias in terms of the way that the cases are handled by law enforcement. I think it's the state's attorney's responsibility to uh, address that, address it directly with the chiefs of the department, with the individual officers, uh, to make sure that that doesn't continue. Uh, and furthermore, if there is bias, then I think it's the responsibility of the state's attorney to make sure that justice is served. And in some cases, that may mean the case not going forward. Thank you. Mr. Finnerty. Well, <clears throat> as the Lamont County State's Attorney, I review all the cases that come into the office. I decide what, what I'm going to charge, if I'm going to charge, uh, what conditions of release I'm going to be looking for, what sentence recommendation I'm going to make. Uh, and I, I do it really on a race and gender neutral basis. Um, just on what's you know what's in front of me, and you know we have had uh, implicit bias training. The state's attorneys have an annual training uh, in June, and well, that, not this year, but last year we had a training from uh, an implicit bias. And it, it you know I acknowledge that it exists. Uh, I try to make my decisions, and I I think I do free of any. Uh, any bias on my part. When I worked in Barry with Terry Trono, he used to say that you can't uh, you can't give somebody represented by an attorney a better deal than we, than you would give the guy that works in the Granite Shed who can't afford to have a lawyer. So you know my recommendations are fair across the board. You know I charge what I can prove. I recommend the sentence that I think is fair. I don't overcharge. I don't try to leverage people into changing their plea because the potential consequence is greater. Uh, with a more serious charge, and I, I have seen some instances in Lamoille County that gave me some pause, um, but I, I try to, uh, when the case comes to me, I try to do things fairly across the board, and you know I know the departments are working uh, as a result of what happened with state police. All the departments are. I think more sensitive to the issue than they used to be. Um, but I had, a, I had a case the other week, the guy was charged with domestic assault, he's from New York. I looked at his criminal history and it was, it, he had spent six months in Rikers Island on a misdemeanor uh, soliciting a prostitute charge. And he was black and it was just so obvious to me that he had you know, been arrested on a misdemeanor, sat in jail for six months until he got to talk to a lawyer and pled out for time served uh, and moved on in his life. But it's like, you know, that's what's happening more in other parts of the country than this in Vermont. You know, it is a big problem and I try to be aware of it every day. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Uh, implicit and explicit bias is a large problem throughout the entire country and I am pleased to see that the Vermont State Police are taking this seriously and going through um, some more training on that. If I were to have a case come across my desk where it was evident to me that the only reason why that individual was being charged was on the basis of either their race or their gender, um, then I would take that very seriously and I would address that with the law enforcement folks that I work with. I think not only in deciding what to charge but also in deciding what sort of sentence recommendation uh, to impose or to argue to the judge is also important. I've represented folks uh, of color and I have noticed that they have, um, at least one in particular, had very long criminal history. And it didn't just stem from Vermont, it stemmed from other parts of the country. And so even though I'm, I had complete faith that my state's attorney that I was going up against wasn't charging this individual on the basis of race and based on the facts of the case, I couldn't help but wonder how much of that individual's criminal history was based on their race um, and how much that individual may or may not have been targeted uh, due to their race. And when we sentence folks in Vermont, we look at the history and the characteristics of the defendant, and criminal history can be a big 
big factor in that. And if that person has a lengthy criminal history and that they've been charged or convicted in other parts of the state um, because of their race, that's a, that's a big problem. The other thing that I saw is I went to jury draw with this individual. He's African American. There was not a single African American person in that jury pool. There was not a single person that was non-white in that jury pool. And even though I can, you know, voir dire on issues of race, I, I wonder if that individual is given a fair trial. And that's me thinking as a defense attorney, but I think that we as prosecutors also have a responsibility to just, it, to not just rely on the defense to hold us accountable, but to ensure that every individual is given a fair trial. Thank you. Scott Lee. The beauty of being number five is I can say I agree with most of that. <laughs> um, but I do agree and believe that there is both implicit and explicit uh, bias that exists. After all, Vermont is a pretty white state and minorities stick out. And uh, law enforcement uh, can spot minorities very easily. I, I believe the state's attorney must be colorblind. Uh, it's easier, I think, for a state's attorney to be colorblind because you can look at an affidavit or a report that's brought in by law enforcement and you can just look at the facts and hopefully ignore or, or not even consider race. The difficulty, I think, is more law enforcement. Uh, they're the ones on the front line and they're the ones who initiate the stop. And I am convinced, having been a defense lawyer for 35 years, uh, that there are folks who get pulled over for failure to put on a right turn signal and there are f folks who don't get pulled over. Some do, some don't. And you tend to wonder, why does this person get uh, pulled over and the other doesn't? Uh, if you can in any way look at statistics and look at proportionality to make a comparison, I think that would help a lot. Um, but I do believe it exists, and if you find it or believe it's there, then I think you have to make appropriate uh, responses and uh, not prosecute if necessary. Thank you very much. So I'm going to offer this question first to the folks from Lamoille County. Uh, maybe Mr. Shove, we'll start with you, Ms. Anderson, Mr. Finnerty. Uh, and then we'll see if others would like to, to weigh in as well. But unquestionably, prosecutors have extraordinary power and discretion, perhaps uh, in no area more than in plea offers. My question is, how do you intend to ensure a fair and consistent approach to plea bargaining in your office? And will you publicly announce the approach that you adopt? Well, I, I think every plea is going to be based on the circumstances and the evidence. Um, and so in terms of trying to develop a playbook um, so that every case is handled the same is going to be a very difficult thing to do. Sorry about that. Um, that being said, I, I think generally speaking it's the practice or has been the practice in lots of um, state's attorney's offices that, for instance, for uh, DUI cases, if it's a first offense and there's no uh, accident, then perhaps maybe a fine only would be the appropriate resolution. resolution. Um, and then if there's uh, a certain blood alcohol level that was reached as the result of that, then perhaps maybe um, some supervision with the Department of Corrections and participation in uh, a substance abuse treatment program should be appropriate. Um, and so I think you can apply some um, consistency to, to the plea agreements, but some of the, the more serious cases, it's going to be very difficult to do that. If you have a, you know, an aggravated assault case, for instance, uh, where somebody's injured, I don't think there's a formula that you can apply to that. Um, so the answer is no, I'm not going to announce any particular system that I'm going to apply as a state's attorney. Uh, I'm going to try to be as consistent as possible, but you've really got to look at the facts of every single case when you're, when you're making your offers to resolve. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. I agree. Every uh, case is different and has its own set of facts. However, I do think that there are low-level general crimes that you can set guidelines for where defendants are similar, similarly situated. And I think those types of cases are driving with suspended license, um, 
those cases often can be all handled in the same, uh, same manner. A uh, low amount of uh, larcenies can generally be handled in the same manner, as well as uh, DUIs. Um, I think even within DUI, you can set up guidelines based on what happened in the case. So I do think that there are cases where you can set guidelines, and I plan on um, explaining those guidelines if I'm elected state's attorney. I think they'll be most useful to defense attorneys um, so that they know what they're getting into when they bring their client in. And I think that's important so they know where we're starting. Um, but as to the more serious cases, the violent cases, the drug trafficking cases, I think um, those cases are more complicated. It'll be to depend on the evidence and the individual's criminal history. There's a lot more uh, factors in play there, and I don't think guidelines could be set. Um, but again, where I can set guidelines, I will try to do so. Mr. Finnerty. Well. <clears throat> The state's attorney's office in Lamoille County consists of myself, one deputy, two victim advocates, and two support staff people. So my deputy is Tom Kelly, who was the former state's attorney in Washington County. Between the two of us, we have 70 years of criminal law experience, mostly as prosecutors. We worked together in Washington County for nine years. So we both look at cases the same way. So I don't really need any guidelines because I charge all the cases, I make all the, uh, I make all the offers to resolve the case. Um, you know, if you have to look at the case, how strong it is, how weak it is, um, what the collateral consequences are going to be, uh, what the victim's position is. There are a lot of different issues that go into it. You may have a domestic assault case where the victim really doesn't want to participate in the prosecution because we have a one-size-fits-all solution for domestic violence cases in Vermont that a lot of people just don't fit into. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a lesser charge and you could include a probation condition that the, that the defendant participate in domestic violence counseling as part of a, a non-domestic violence charge. Uh, people who are convicted of domestic violence who are hunters don't want to get convicted because it affects their ability to own a firearm or carry a firearm. So a lot of times the collateral consequences are significant. People have, uh, you know, older family members living in Canada. If they get a DUI conviction, it makes it difficult for them to, to go to Canada. So there are a lot of different factors that go into the, the nature of the plea agreement. And, you know, if somebody comes in on a DUI case and they plead not guilty and they come into the status conference and they've already completed uh, a course of alcohol counseling, they have an ignition interlock device on their car, uh, and they're willing to, you know, willing to take responsibility for the offense, there's really no reason to put them on probation, even though that might have been your original offer, because the hard work has been done by the individual. So, um, you know, I'm just gonna keep doing what I've been doing, uh, what Tom's been doing, and, you know, if we get somebody new in the office, then we'll, we'll talk about what works and what doesn't work, but. Thank you. I'm gonna ask if any of the other candidates wanted to respond, and I would just note that the question asked about a fair and consistent approach, and the word guideline was introduced by the panel was not, <laughs> uh, was not in fact a part of the question, but would any of the other three like to weigh in on uh, how you would adopt a fair and consistent approach and would you publicize how you do that? Mr. Cornelius. One of the most significant changes that I intend on making if I am elected state's attorney in Orleans County is to only prosecute cases that are supported by admissible evidence. This will ensure that guilty pleas are based on a factual basis. As of right now, this might be the law, but it's not the standard in Orleans County, and it's time that we turn that around. Thank you. Ms. Davis, if you want. Um, I, I echo a lot of what my Lamoille County counterparts have said, and that it's, it's difficult to say that this is going to be, um, I guess they use the word guidelines, in adopting a uniform approach to the every single offense. Um, in Essex County, we actually only do uh, jury draw and pretrials twice a year, whereas other counties um, have jury trials every single month. And there's a lot of time that people who want a trial spend 
waiting for their trial. And I would absolutely take into consideration any remedial measures that an individual did while they're waiting for their trials, such as uh, participating in a substance abuse treatment, going to an inpatient facility, anything like that. Uh, I would take that into consideration when I, when I um, offer them a deal. So it could very well change between arraignment and when they actually plead. I agree with Mr. Cornelius that every, you know, the Vermont Supreme Court has said that every guilty plea has to be supported by a factual basis. And there are some individuals that will plead and they'll say, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to take responsibility for this, but I'm also going to say that the state has enough evidence to convict me. I don't, necessarily like that approach because what are we doing with those individuals that say, yeah, I know you could convict me, but I didn't actually do it and I'm not actually going to um, do anything to help rehabilitate myself and, and prevent this from happening further. Um, so I would like to get away from the no contest pleas and either have enough evidence to convict that individual through a jury trial or have enough evidence uh, to support a guilty verdict or a guilty plea, I should say. Scott, please, sure. if you'd like. Um, a, a couple things. On, on the initial uh, question uh, regarding guidelines and standards, I, I do agree with what most folks have said uh, between serious and non-serious cases. There needs to be a distinction. Uh, obviously, the non-serious cases have a much higher volume, and so it's very much easier uh, to set forth, whether you use the term guidelines or not, a plan on how you want to address uh, folks in that. This, the more serious ones, of course, uh, are less numerous, more complicated, and, uh, and need to be looked at individually. Um, on the issue of that was mentioned on overcharging, uh, I do believe that it is, in fact, ethically important uh, that a state's attorney only present and charge those cases which he or she believes can be proven. And I mean, that accomplishes a lot uh, aside from uh, time and expense on both sides. It, it gets down to the, to the nitty gritty and moves cases along so you're not plea bargaining on issues uh, that you think shouldn't have been brought in the first place. So I will open this up to all of you in, in any order that, uh, that, that you choose. And that is that many people don't realize that state's attorneys are involved in child abuse, neglect cases, and uh, in mental health cases. And my question for you is, how do you plan to balance the privacy rights of families and citizens with the need to protect the public? I guess I'll start. Right. Uh, so I've been doing, uh, we call them CHINS cases for child, children in need of care and supervision, and the other um, issues that we see involving juveniles are those that are under the age of 18 who have committed a delinquency, um, committed an offense that would have been charged uh, in criminal court, but for virtue of their age. I have always said that everybody in a juvenile proceeding, it's a confidential proceeding, but everybody in that room is on the same team. Everybody want it, wants what's best for that child, and they want that child to have a safe and stable home. We just have differences of opinion as far as how we're going to get there. I think that if a child is being abused or neglected at home and that child's safety is at risk, then the state should intervene. But the state does need to also balance that against the fact that the right to parent is a constitutional right and should not be taken uh, lightly. The, we have very clear uh, standards that we need to meet in order to establish a CHINS petition. We have standards that we need to meet in order to um, get parents to engage in services. And then we also have uh, very high standards to meet if we are going to terminate the rights to those parents and free that child for adoption. That is where my passion is. Um, I do in, I. I do have a passion for criminal law, but I would rather give these children a leg up now before they turn 18 than turn around and prosecute them for something that they did once they turn 18. So. Thank you. Ms. Scottley. Sure. This is an area that's probably the most emotional uh, part of the job. Um, you look to see what 
you, you have the standard of what, you know, perhaps what's in the best interest of the child. And of course, you, once you say that, you probably have about 10 people all throwing what they believe to be the best interest of the child. And when you have those emotions that get in the way, sometimes it's difficult. Um, it's important uh, that investigators be able to do thorough and good background checks. Um, you sometimes, uh, even when you know that there, a child is in danger and there is a possibility of placement, sometimes you need to wonder what is the motivation of the person who wants the child. Um, there are just so many so many issues, uh, but the bottom line is one must balance the best interest of the child and keep the emotions out as best as you can. Thank you. Ms. Cornelius? The short and easy answer for this um, is that my intention for cases of this nature, for juvenile and mental health cases specifically, my intention for that would be to appoint and hire a chief deputy who is a lawyer who is familiar with these kinds of cases, because I am not. I'm not a lawyer. Oddly enough, I happen to be an expert in criminal, civil, and appellate procedure. Um, juvenile and mental health proceedings is something that I have not had any experience in. Because of the importance and sensitivity of these things, I would appoint a chief deputy to handle these cases. I will say this, that the balance between privacy and the community against what is disclosable to the public is a very serious matter and requires a very careful balance. Thank you. Do you want to wait? Sure. Um, so I think in the Chin's petition that the privacy rights are of the utmost uh, importance in those types of cases. You're dealing with young, uh, younger children that are oftentimes troubled. Um, and I see it, those cases as an opportunity to make sure uh, that they don't re-enter the system once they're adults. And I think um, you're working with the team that's assigned to them, and I, I understand that uh, a lot of there's a lot of different opinions on what's in the best interest, but as a state's attorney, I think it's be really important to stay open-minded and listen to all those opinions um, and make sure that the outcome is in the best interest of the child and ensuring that you're not gonna see them again once they um, hit the legal age and come back into the system. I think uh, weighing mental health, the, it, turning to mental health, I think weighing, weighing privacy rights and public safety in those uh, situations can be sometimes more difficult because they're oftentimes, um, you know, there's really a lack of resources in dealing with mental health. And I think um, it would be a great thing if I was Lexus State's attorney, if I could work with law enforcement to better help those who uh, need mental health treatment, but it's definitely lacking throughout the state. And I think um, Sometimes those individuals uh, can be quite dangerous and pose a threat to society and the public safety. So I think um, that needs to be a consideration when determining um, how much the, the privacy rights as well. Mr. Schilf. Well, the, the uh, juvenile proceedings are uh, closed proceedings. So I think there is an inherent confidentiality there. Um, but that being said, it, just because the doors are closed doesn't mean that information can't get out. And so I think it's imperative that the state's attorney's office work with the Department of Children and Family Services, with law enforcement to the extent that they're involved in the cases to make sure that really those, the confidences or the confidentiality is, is maintained in those kinds of cases. Um, as to the mental health uh, cases, I, I have expressed previously that I, that I have concerns. Um, the current system we have now is when there is a, a suspected issue of mental health, we contact our local mental health agency and have somebody come over and do an evaluation. And the evaluation is based on self-reporting of the individual uh, and a set series of questions that they're asked. And so if somebody is laying down in the middle of Main Street in Newport, Vermont and getting almost run over by cars, but answers the questions right, then they're deemed not to have a mental health issue. And so we've got to come up with a better way of identifying who it is that has the mental health issue, what the mental health issue is, and what can we do for them. That being said, we do have a responsibility to protect the public. And until we can accurately figure out what's going on with some of these folks, we've got to you know, continue through the, the criminal court system, um, impose conditions of release, make sure that there's no way that they can harm themselves or others. Thank you. Mr. Finnerty, do you want to respond? Uh, could you repeat the question? No. 
Yes. Uh, so I, many people don't realize that the states that state attorneys are involved in child abuse and neglect cases and mental health cases. How do you plan to balance the privacy rights of families and citizens with the need to protect the public? Well, first, I'd like to start out by saying that, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, I believe I'm the only, the only candidate in Lamoille County that actually has experience in Vermont Family Court or with mental health cases in Vermont. So, um, you know, in Chint's cases, there's not really an issue with, um, everybody knows the proceedings are confidential. Um, I can't think of a case in which there was a, a, a disclosure of, of confidential information as a result of a chintz proceeding. Um, in delinquency cases, those are also supposed to be confidential, but by the same token, under the recently passed uh, legislation this year that all cases that go to diversion become, uh, are confidential once the, uh, the offer's been accepted. So, um, you know, it's challenging because the public has a, has a right to know, but then again, you know, the, the person has, uh, has HIPAA protected rights as a, as a patient for, you know, that prevent against the disclosure of some information. And, um, and the other, I mean, I haven't seen it come up yet, but in the recent legislation increasing the jurisdictional age of the family court, the legislature created a, um, what I think is, is a, an issue where if you're a juvenile and you're charged with, you get arrested for drunk driving, you get charged in adult court. But if you're a juvenile who commits a felony, like if you're a juvenile who is drinking and driving and hits and kills someone, your case is handled in the, in the family court. And, you know, that's what the legislature passed, and it's a, I think it's gonna be a huge issue in the future, because if you're the family of the victim in a DUI fatal by someone who's under the age of, uh, the age of oh, 19 or under, um, you know, there's a limit to the information we get about how the proceeding is, is going along or what the outcome is gonna be. But, I, you know, I'm also conscious of the fact that, you know, if you're, 16 or 17 years old and you get charged in adult court, um, you know, that's gonna have significant collateral consequences to you in the future, uh, whereas if you're charged in, in family court, there aren't those consequences. Time permitting, we'll loop back to a question that addresses uh, some of those issues. So the next question again, for anyone who wants to answer, and I will say that this is the, the topic that garnered the most proposed questions. Uh, there has been a dramatic, some might say, seismic shift in attitudes and laws about marijuana. There has also been increasing discussion about a harm reduction model for controlled substances in general and particularly related to the opiate crisis. What will you do as state's attorney to address the opiate crisis and the use, possession, and sale of illegal drugs. Who wants it? I can start us off. Okay, thank um, you. So I, Vermont is fortunate that individuals who are suffering from substance abuse disorders have ready access to treatment. We have this great hub and spoke model. Um, I don't think the criminal justice system should be the default for drug treatment. However, whether prosecution for a drug offense is a case-by-case -case determination, uh, which needs to be decided on the facts of the case. I do believe that uh, most individuals that come through the court system that have drug-related crimes uh, should go to diversion. I think that individuals who are suffering from addiction should go, to, go through diversion so that they have the access to treatment. Um, that is if they're willing and want treatment. I believe that individuals, though, who are selling uh, drugs such as heroin and are preying on addicts should be handled tougher. I think that sellers, those sellers need to be dealt with um, 
most of the time not with the tools of diversion. I think that those individuals um, often need to face greater consequences for their actions. I don't, I, I don't think that um, we can move to, uh, I know that, that we talked about, the, you mentioned the harm reduction model, and I think that as long as that harm reduction model uh, involves an increased access to treatment, um, that's the model that I would like to follow. Additionally, I mentioned earlier in Lamoille County, I'd like to bring a treatment court just to give us another tool in order to deal with the opiate crisis. Thank you. Mr. Shelf? Sure. Um, so I, th I think we have to recognize that as it relates to uh, the opiate crisis, um, there's a different, a different groups of people we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who are drug addicts and consumers of the drug. There are those who are drug addicts and are distributing within their own communities. And then there are those people who are bringing in massive quantities of drugs to the state of Vermont. And so we've got to address every single one of those groups differently. Uh, as to the, the high volume um, drug dealers, I think they have to be uh, prosecuted aggressively. Um, and, I, they've, and those are the kinds of cases that would warrant serious time in jail. Um, everybody who is a consumer of drugs and has a drug problem is entitled to treatment. Uh, every effort should be made to be, provide them with whatever rehabilitative services that are available to them. Um, that being said, I think it's imperative that the state's attorney's office work with local law enforcement and the Vermont Drug Task Force to identify who fits into each of those individual groups uh, and address each one of them appropriately. Thank you. Mr. Finnerty, do you want to weigh in? Sure. So I've been the state's attorney in Lamar County for three and a half years. Last year we had, I believe, one possession of heroin charge in the county. Uh, We've had zero drug trafficking cases filed in my county in three and a half years. Um, you know, it's great to talk about it and how are you gonna to be tough on these, these people that are trafficking large quantities of drugs into Lamoille County, but I'm not sure where they are. And it's not that I don't know where they are, but local law enforcement isn't generating the information either. So we had one trafficking case that I did a lot of work on that involved a woman from, the, from New York who was, uh, her daughter was selling, she, well she was bringing drugs up and there was, her daughter was being set up in the business, she made enough money to buy a house in Morristown and was gonna sell drugs out of the house. And as soon as we generated enough information to raise the case to a level where it could be charged as trafficking, uh, the U.S. Attorney took it over. So. You know, the Lamoille County State's Attorney is not going to be prosecuting a lot of trafficking cases because th they don't exist. Or if they do exist, they're gonna be prosecuted in the federal court because they involve people in other states and there's a lot of uh, surveillance that goes on and there's a lot of asset recovery that has to go on. And this woman had three bank accounts. She's got property in New York. She's got property in the Dominican Republic. You know, I don't have the resources to go after that stuff, but the feds do. So, and you know, we're never gonna have a treatment court in Lamoille County because we don't have the numbers to support it. Treatment courts are very labor intensive. You need a judge and a block of time every week. You need case managers and it, it's very resource intensive. And the reason that we don't need a treatment court in Lamoille County is because people are getting treatment on the front end. We don't have to compel people to engage in treatment by holding a hammer over their head and saying, if you complete treatment, we'll dismiss this felony case against you because the people are being provided the opportunity to get into treatment on the front end of the process with using the pretrial monitors. We're sending people to diversion for simple possession cases. They're getting into treatment. They're being successful. They're going on and being um, successful members of the community. And the one- uh, Mr. Finnerty, in the interest of time. Give me 30 seconds. Give me 30 seconds. But I'm gonna reduce it from the another answer. All right. Finish your answer, but. So the, the, I think the bigger concern with the harm reduction model, for example, in Chittenden County, they're talking about having safe injection sites and, and Ms. Anderson's father is the commissioner of public safety and he's deadly opposed to it or deathly opposed to it. He thinks it's a terrible idea. But in talking with the 
primary care physicians in Lamoille County who are, who are acting as the spokes in the hub and spoke system and treating people who are in medication assisted treatment in their offices in the community. The greater harm is that when you have a cohort of people that are using intravenous drugs, there are other diseases that are, that are in the mix. And if you have a lot of people that are using dirty needles, or shearing needles, at some point you're gonna be dealing with people that have hepatitis Mr. or Finity, HIV. Thank you for that, I'm gonna cut you a, off. It becomes a much larger problem than just getting people into medication. I'm gonna direct this question to all the other candidates and it's a perfect segue and it deals with safe use or safe injection facilities. So part of a harm reduction model is the argument that intravenous drug users should have a clean, safe location where they can go uh, to use their substance of choice free from the risk of being arrested. So I'm wondering if the other candidates would like to weigh in on whether they support the idea of safe use or safe injection facilities. I would note that at least one state's attorney in the state uh, has supported the idea, and maybe I'll start at the end, Ms. Scottlieb, if you wish sure. to weigh in. Sure, and I believe Let's that's... Let's confine our answers to a minute here, please. All right, I'll be quick. Uh, yes, I believe it's Chittenden County that uh, the state's attorney has uh, uh, proposed that option. Um, I, and I have to confess, until I heard her uh, proposal, I hadn't really given it a lot of thought. Um, but after thinking about it, I mean, the bottom line is uh, you don't want somebody uh, who needs a fix uh, going out and doing something illegal or harming themselves or, or others around them. So I think it is a novel idea and a pretty good one to have those safe injection sites. I guess I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other as far as whether we should implement safe injection sites. I, I just think, I, I hope that there's success for them in Chittenden County, but I struggle with just the practical question of where in the hell would I even put it in Essex County? I mean, we are out in the middle of nowhere. There's no BART clinic out there. There's no counseling out there. There's no resources out there to begin with. I I can't imagine somebody that is struggling with addiction, uh, is struggling with poverty, it's a huge problem out there, is going to get in their car and drive half an hour, 45 minutes um, to a safe injection site. I'm not opposed to the idea. Uh, I just think practically speaking, I don't, I don't even know where I would put it out there. Um, I have been in talks with the Coas County State's Attorney, uh, Deputy State attorney. She was actually my roommate here at VLS. Um, she is right across the river from Guildhall where the courthouse is located. And they are also struggling with the lack of resources out there and having to send folks over to Grafton County. And I'd like to see where we could possibly collaborate there to bring in um, some treatment for folks in Essex County. Thank you. Mr. Shove, do you want to weigh in? Uh, very briefly. I, I much like Ms. Davis, I'm not necessarily opposed to safe injection sites. Uh, again, Lamoille County is, is very rural. I don't know if it would make a lot of sense to do that there. Um, but w I do understand that the opiate uh, epidemic is, is, in addition, is, is a medical crisis in that the people that are taking the drugs are using dirty needles and there are other consequences to that. And so I think we can come up with other ways of providing users with resources to make sure that they're getting clean needles. But if you're gonna get a clean needle, then I think you've gotta be able to uh, be provided with the opportunity to seek treatment at the same time. Thank you. Ms. Anderson? Uh, so first I'd like to say that I'm the one running for state's attorney and I have done uh, research on this issue looking at the studies from both uh, Vancouver, Canada, which is one of the places leading this, as well as Australia. And I think that, um, I think looking at those studies impo is important and my reading of those studies as it stands now is that uh, say we shouldn't be putting money towards safe injection sites. First of all, they're very costly, millions and millions of dollars. And if our goal is to reduce the number of people addicted to opiates, there's just not enough evidence to support the use of safe injection sites. Um, one of the arguments made about them is that they're a pathway to treatment. Again, there's very little data supporting that uh, contention. And I think Vermont has made great strides to making sure that those who want treatment get treatment. We have the uh, proven programs already. Uh, Mr. Show brought it up, the, the syringe exchange programs. Those people have 
ready access to treatment, and we should continue to support those programs and not spend our limited resources. Again, these programs cost millions of dollars and, you know, have very little, uh, re there's very little results yet to show that they work. Our priorities should focus on prevention, treatment, and recovery, uh, and we should use our limited resources more wisely than using them at safe injection sites. Thank you. Mr. Cornelius? We need to begin to live in reality and we need to recognize how serious the heroin and fentanyl epidemic actually is. We need to understand also collectively that to be an addict in and of itself is not a criminal act and that doesn't make someone a criminal. It doesn't actually arise to a state's attorney's attention unless that addict is committing a petty crime as, as, a, as a means to support his habit, to support their habit. I draw a fine line between people who are addicted and mess up and those that traffic um, large amounts of heroin and fentanyl into our community. We need to be treating addicts who mess up like exactly what they are, and we need to develop a zero tolerance policy when it comes to sales and trafficking. Um, if we can engage it in that way, then I believe that we can begin to curb the problem. As far as safe injection sites, I don't believe that that's the answer to the problem because that's as if to say that if we can't beat them, then we might as well join them. And I don't think that that's the answer. For our government to begin to become the heroin dealer, I don't believe that that's the answer. I think that we need to take other approaches. Thank you. So the Center for Justice Reform at VLS worked closely with two prosecutors in Vermont, Sarah George in Chittenden County and the Windsor County State's Attorney David Cahill, who has uh, joined us here this evening, uh, to help Vermonters expunge or remove old marijuana convictions from their record. My question is, do you support broadening of the expungement laws in Vermont so that they would be automatic as opposed to requiring the citizen to petition. And uh, apologies for the compound question, but do you see it as an appropriate role for a state's attorney to assist a citizen in removing an old criminal conviction from their record? Anyone who would like to weigh in? Mr. Gottlieb. I'll start. Um, and, and I assume your question, you're just dealing with marijuana convictions. Well, you can open it up to any okay. type of Okay. Conviction. Well, uh, marijuana convictions are very clear and they're very obvious. If the legislature has determined that an act is not a crime, uh, then those folks, of course, who have been convicted of that uh, should have their records expunged. I guess the next question and what you're really asking is, what is the procedure on how to do that? Um, you know, there are, I suppose, there are a couple different ways. Uh, one, the state's attorney could take it upon himself or herself to actually make contact uh, with some of those old folks. Obviously, the court is in possession of records and perhaps we would know the last known address of those folks uh, to at least notify them of the option uh, that they are eligible. Uh, your question, I guess, then is what, to what extent the state's attorney ought to get involved? Um, that's a hard one. I, I do believe that they should make it easy. Uh, whether they take the initiative, I don't know. I think uh, perhaps if one deputy state's attorney is designated as the, the go-to person uh, to assist with uh, expungements, uh, then that, that could be the person. It would be nice if the legislature enacted something that automatically takes care of the expungement so that the state's attorney does not have to do it. I think that would be an easier, quicker, and cleaner way. Steve. So, um, we are actually hosting an expungement day in Essex County on uh, the 11th of this month for anybody in Essex County or the surrounding counties that want to come out and um, have us walk you through the process in order to expunge your records. I would 
you know, I'd like to entertain the idea of having a deputy to do that, but unfortunately my position is funded as a part-time position. I don't get a deputy, so it would be solely up to me. I think at the very least uh, the process can be a bit confusing for folks and that if they need help going through that process, uh, there should be some resources for those folks to do that, either um, some defense attorneys or legal aid or whoever it is that um, can help them with that process. I think at the very least if an individual did not go through the process of trying to expunge their records, and there is a, a fee associated with that, that if that individual happened to commit a new crime and I was looking at their uh, criminal record and there were offenses on there that could have been expunged and they just weren't um, because they didn't go through that process, I would try not to, or I would not hold that against them um, if they just didn't want to go through the burdensome and tedious process and, you know, for some people, quite expensive process of getting those convictions off their record. Um, I think that, you know, we shouldn't limit it to just marijuana, but all other offenses that are eligible for expungement, if that's where our legislature passed, um, you know, I'm required to follow the law on that. So, um, yep. For clarification purposes, who was the we when you said we're holding an expungement information session? Sure, it's um, the Caledonia County Bar Association along with Legal Aid um, and the state's attorney's office is holding a workshop up there. Uh, we've reached out to um, the Caledonia County State's Attorney, Orleans County State's Attorney um, to try to hold similar expungement workshops there, but um, I will be there helping folks with their petitions. Would anyone else like to weigh in on the expungement question? Sure. Um, I, I think the, I would hope the legislature would consider waiving the $90 filing fee for people that want to have those old cases expunged because that's really a, that's a pretty high hurdle for people that may have a number of prior misdemeanors that could be expunged. Uh, I'm also troubled that there are a lot of cases that I see in people's criminal record checks that should be expunged where people have either successfully completed diversion or they've completed a deferred sentence and they would be entitled to have the record expunged. Um, but in back in olden days, they required an action step on the part of the person who successfully completed the programming after two years to notify the court that they wanted the record expunged. And I think we could have a more proactive approach uh, I had a case, I was uh, involving a 19-year-old woman who was charged with a uh, simple assault and I looked at her criminal history and she had an arrest record from when she was 12 in Vermont and not only was it still on her, she was 19, at the, she's 19 today, this is when she was 12, uh, and it was supported by photos and fingerprints and she had an NCIC number from the National Crime Information Center. and. I called the Vermont Criminal Information Center and said, you know, this is just wrong. This shouldn't exist. So, uh, you know, I looked at her record recently and I saw that they had at least uh, deleted her fingerprints and photos and um, deleted, so she's no longer listed as a criminal in the National Crime Information Center for something that she did when she was 12, but they still have the arrest record here in Vermont and it seems to me that with today's, in today's day and age, that Vermont Criminal Information Center, uh, which is administered by the P Department of Public Safety, you know, every year they could probably sweep through the system and delete the records for people who had turned 18 that year. Thank you. I mean, it, it would be kind of a no-brainer instead of doing it on a piecemeal basis. Mr. Shove, do you want to weigh in? Briefly, uh, I support the, the past um, programs uh, in the various counties where they've had expungement days. I think that makes sense. If that is in fact the most uh, efficient way of, of going through the process. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there that have um, misdemeanor convictions on their record because they did something stupid when they were too young to really understand what they were doing. And if that conviction is preventing them from getting housing or in, uh, getting financial aid to go to school, then they shouldn't continue to be punished based on that one instance. However, I think if other than the situations like the small amounts of where marijuana where um, it's no longer a crime, I think then there should be a little more oversight in the process uh, and, the, and the expungement shouldn't just be automatic. Thanks. I think yes. I think that those individuals who are entitled to expungements and the situations where it's appropriate should 
should get them. And I think you had asked about whether there should be exta uh, expand to a more a automatic system. I think um, I think that might be more difficult in uh, with adults, but I think that definitely should be the case when you're dealing with juvenile cases. You know, they're uh, at a different place in their life, um, and those convictions can haunt them for a really long time. We um, we're just informed that you know that on applications for financial aid, that a drug conviction for somebody um, under 18, you know, at all that's applying, that that can be a bar to getting financial aid. And that person, those people are probably entitled to expungements, and that's just really not fair because you're hindering their ability um, to get an education and better themselves. So I think that an automatic process would make sense uh, in terms of juveniles. I think that those, again, those who are entitled to expungements should receive them. Thank you. Mr. Cornelius, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I support any lobbying efforts that take place that uh, concludes to waive any filing fee or to make that process automatic. Expungement is a whole nother proceeding all on its own. State's attorneys should be spearheading this um, and not relying on defense counsel to make this happen. Um, in the meantime, bef uh, while the legislature is mulling these things over, if I were elected state's attorney, then I would certainly hold the first ever expungement day in Orleans County and make sure that that happened. Thank you. I forgot to mention, we're actually doing the expungement day on the 18th as well, but the calendar in my brain only goes through the primary on the 14th right now, so. <laughs> Fair enough, but thank you. That's uh, I'm gonna loop back to what broadly might be considered as a harm reduction question and uh, preface my remark by saying that in Seattle, the, the police department years ago started a program called LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. The Gloucester, Massachusetts police chief adopted a similar model and I know the Montpelier police chief a few years ago discussed a similar model as well. And under that model, citizens who were drug users could come to the police department, turn over what they had in their possession and get an immediate referral to treatment without being arrested and without the case being sent to the prosecution's office. In a minute or less, would you comment on whether you think police should have the ability to refer a citizen direct, directly to treatment uh, without sending the matter to you for your consideration as state's attorney? You wanna start? Mr. Cornelius. Typically, my opinion would be that law enforcement shouldn't have any business um, getting involved in that kind of thing, uh, treatment of an individual that has a drug addiction. But in this case, I believe that I would support that initiative. Okay. I think that uh, it sounds like it would be similar to a gun buyback program. Is that sort of the idea? So th the notion is that a citizen could come to the police department, turn over their illegally possessed drugs, they would be immune from prosecution, they'd get referred to treatment, and the prosecutor, the state's attorney, would not know that they have uh, come part to the of that police. Well, I think that um, I would support a program like that within limits, obviously, if you're turning over kilos of heroin, there might be an issue. But I think that for possessory amounts, that if um, an individual you know, on their own went and sought out um, the police in order to you know, become a law-abiding citizen and then sought treatment, I think that would be a great program um, to institute, but again, with some limitations. <laughs> I would agree with Ms. Anderson. I don't think that uh, anyone should be punishing those who were seeking to better themselves. Um, if somebody's got a drug problem and they're willing to go to the police and say, this is my problem, it's a great place as a repository for the drugs. At least they're not going someplace out on the streets. Uh, and if they're seeking the help, then uh, more power to them. Mr. Finnerty. Um I think the fundamental concept is sound. Um, I have some concerns about how it would be how it would be monitored. So, you know, if so, for example, if someone comes into court and they have a substance abuse issue, and maybe they come in on the basis of a simple possession charge, we refer them to the pretrial monitor. They use evidence-based tools to screen them to determine if there's a, a treatment need. Uh, if there is, we can, you know, we can get them into detox, we can get them into the Broward Retreat, we can get them into Valle Vista, uh, pretty much seamlessly from the courthouse. 
and their, their performance is monitored by the pretrial monitor, who determines whether they're in compliance or not and reports back to the court. Uh, it's really hard to get information about people staying in treatment, because people can, it's voluntary, people can leave at any time, and because of HIPAA, the treatment places won't, they won't tell you who's there or who isn't there. Um, and I'm not sure, I think in a, in a more urban area than Lamoille County, it would probably make sense if you had more access to, um, you know, more immediate access to treatment. I, I kind of like the idea that you're talking about, about uh, giving people Suboxone at the hospital if they show up and they're in need of Suboxone and putting that into a treatment package so they have some stability for a couple of days and Thank then you. get them into treatment. Ms. Davis. I would support an initiative like that. Um, I think that it's a, it's a good way for, you know, number one, to get some drugs off the street so that they're not trading it for other um, other things or giving it away or putting it in the hands of somebody else. And I think that it's an opportunity to get that individual treatment to um, prevent them from offending down the road. And I don't think that law enforcement necessarily needs my stamp of approval if that individual wants to engage in treatment and go right to Valley Vista or another uh, rehabilitation program. We don't need any any more oversight than is what's necessary. Yeah, I support it. I think it takes a great amount of courage for somebody to come in to a p police station and say, this is what I have. I have a problem. I need assistance. That person is taking a big first step. And the fact that it's being initiated by the person as opposed to involuntarily being arrested, uh, I think that does show a lot of courage. Um, I think it is indicative of a compassionate society, and I do believe uh, that it should be encouraged. In one minute or less, please. Instead of being elected as state's attorney, you've been elected as the supreme commander of the universe, which authorizes and empowers you to make any one change in Vermont, in the Vermont criminal justice system or the criminal justice system in this country. You are all powerful. What would that change be? Ms. Davis. <laughs> The change that I would like to see is I would like to see judges on the bench full time in all dockets. In the Northeast Kingdom, we piece together uh, different dockets where we have a judge that will spend one day in one county, a different another day in another county. They rotate around so that there's so that we're only doing criminal court on one specific day. And if we don't get it to it that day, you know, if you don't get to draw your jury that day, then you're drawing it a month from now. Um, and that can really impact some people's ability to move forward in their life. Like I said, in Essex County, we do jury draw twice a year, and right now cases are moving pretty slowly because we're not able to get in front of a judge or not able to get um, resources that we need uh, immediately. And uh, quite frankly, the courthouse in Essex County is always sort of on the verge of shutting down, um, which would make our access to justice problem even worse. Um, and I think that we need full-time judges on the juvenile docket in order to um, hear cases and that we're not putting off cases any longer than is necessary and hindering people's progress. Thank you. Who's up? Mr. Gottlieb. Sure. Um, if I had that magic wand, uh, I think I would address actually the, the issue that I've already addressed because I do think it's the biggest problem. And it is the issue of incarceration versus treatment. Um, if I could take my wand and put it over all the legislators, all the judges, and all the state's attorneys to get that cultural and philosophical shift from warehousing folks to being more compassionate for treatment issues and diversion programs and realize that that is really an enlightened approach and perhaps one of our best hopes for ending the uh, opiate uh, crisis, that's what I would do. Thank you. Mr. Finnerty? Well, if I were the, the supreme being, uh, at least in Vermont, 
Uh, I would wish that all the counties could work as successfully and efficiently as the criminal justice system does in Lamoille County because we are leading the pack in terms of utilizing the tools the legislature has given us to take a more restorative, healing, community benefiting approach to the criminal justice system. And, you know, I used to think it was us against them, and now I realize it's, it's just really us because the people who are committing crimes are members of our community. At some point, they're going to re enter our community. It's up to the criminal justice system to put the pieces back together and figure out what kind of person we want coming back into our communities. Um, you know, and we're, we're making big steps forward. Other counties are not as fortunate. Um, it's a lot of different players in the system, and fortunately, we have some very forward thinking people in Lamoille County, and I, I wish that people in other counties in the state were as fortunate. Thank you. Mr. Shove, do you want to weigh in? If I had the magic wand, I would simply be creating more resources, more law enforcement, rehabilitative services, uh, trying to identify uh, at a younger age what we can do for people to get them off of the track of uh, engaging in criminal behavior uh, and ending up in prisons. Uh, but again, that's a magic wand. I do like that the supreme commander of the universe has a magic wand. That's, a, that's an interesting mix. Uh, Ms. Anderson. So if resources were uh, unlimited and I could do what I want uh, in terms of helping out Vermont, I think that uh, a statewide mental health court or a, big, a bigger focus on mental health um, is where I would put those resources. I think a lot of um, addicts became addicts due to maybe due to mental health issues. I think you see it in um, other types of crimes as well. And I think that if we could address the mental health issues earlier, um, have a court that would solely deal with those issues, have support teams for those individuals, like a treatment court is run, uh, I think would really help public safety and hopefully decrease our uh, both our incarceration rate and crime overall. Thank you. Mr. Cornelius. I would increase our reliance on our restorative justice centers. Um, if there was one thing that I could change with the wand, you know, um, then what I would do is I would, I, would, I would make it so the prosecutors weren't talking about it like it was an option. Restorative justice is actually the law. It's not a prosecutorial option. So if I could change one thing going forward, it'd be to increase our reliance on those laws and those facilities. So since I did not share with the candidates what questions would be asked this evening, I feel like it's fair to ask this final one, and that is, given the time, I would like to afford each of you one minute to make a closing argument uh, for why the voters of your county should vote for you uh, as state's attorney. And let's go in the reverse order from how we started the evening. Mr. Cornelius, a, a minute for your closing argument. First of all, I'm very grateful to Vermont Law School and, and for the ACLU for um, organizing this event and bringing the candidates together, those that could appear. Um, I do wish that my opponent was able to make it today, uh, but unfortunately not, not everything in this world is perfect the way that we might like. In closing, um, I may not be a lawyer, but I do know what's wrong with our criminal justice system, and um, I'm no stranger to the courts. I would hope that the people of Orleans County looked past the fact that I wasn't a lawyer, recognized the fact that I care very deeply about my community, and I am committed to reaching meaningful results in every case. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Sure, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the law school and the ACLU for putting this on. It's been great. A lot of different types of questions, and I really enjoyed it. Um, we have enormous challenges in the criminal justice system, from op opioids to the crime addiction fuels, to a criminal justice system that can seem broken at times. If I'm elected state's attorney in Lamoille County, I'm going to make sure that criminal cases are handled fairly, fairly for the defendants as well as for the victims. If I'm elected, crime victims will have a powerful voice in court and their voices will be heard. I can't do it alone, though. I need uh, your support and most of all your vote, but I think that I'm ready ready to take on the challenges. I have the experience to take on the, uh, 
the caseload and the challenges that are before the state's attorney. And I think that uh, together we can ensure that Lamoille County is not only the safest county, but the best county. Thank you. Mr. Shove. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, as I've indicated, I've been a resident of Lamoille County for 14 years. Um, and in that 14 years, I worked as a deputy state's attorney for almost 10 years. Uh, I developed and harbored some great working relationships with law enforcement and service providers in that county. Um, I would like to bring my experience to Lamoille County uh, and to continue to work with those individuals uh, to make sure that the administration of justice uh, takes place in Lamoille County. Um, I too, like Ms. Anderson, feel that it's important uh, to hold uh, people accountable for their actions. Uh, that may mean that they are accountable through the restorative justice program. It may mean that they're accountable and sent to a correctional facility. Um, it's gonna depend on the circumstances, but I don't agree that every case is appropriate for restorative justice. Uh, so in that regard, I think I can be an aggressive and fair prosecutor. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shove. Mr. Finnerty. Thank you. Um, I make decisions every day as the Lamar County State's Attorney that affect people's lives from the cradle to the grave. And when I make those decisions, I really try to use my experience uh, in the criminal justice system, uh, my love of people, and, um, and I think I do a pretty good job. And I'd like the opportunity to expand on what I've done in the last four years. And my opponents make a big deal about the fact that I don't live in Lamoille County. But I, I did live in Lamoille County when I received 99.16% of the vote four years ago with bipartisan support to do the job. And, you know, in Vermont, the state's attorneys don't have to be a resident of the county in which they serve. And my opponents think that's, a, apparently think it's a bad thing, but in my experience in Vermont, things that have been in place for a long time are usually in place for a reason. And maybe the people in the county should have the opportunity to vote for the most experienced prosecutor that's willing to run for the office, whether they live in the county or not. So I would say it's not a pejorative thing, it's a good thing. And apparently the people of Lamar County agreed and voted me in four years ago. Thank so you. I would hope that I have the opportunity to continue for another four years. Ms. Davis. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you to the law school and to the ACLU for hosting this, and I am very grateful that the ACLU is taking time to uh, bring awareness to uh, who the state's attorneys are and what it is that they do, because a lot of folks don't realize that. Um, I, I know that I'm facing an uphill battle with somebody who has been in Essex County for quite a long time, but I do not believe that the number of years that you've held a law license or the number of years that you have have held a certain position is the requisite for the experience that you need in order to do that job effectively. I do not believe that just because you've had this position for so long means that you have the passion, the drive, or the energy to continue on with that position and be an effective leader in your community. The Northeast Kingdom has been wonderful to me, and I want to keep Essex County on the map and bring Essex County some uh, very badly needed relief to that part of the state. And, that, and I hope that my constituents are watching this tonight and that they will come out and vote on August 14th. Thank you. Mr. Gottlieb. Thank you. I too would like to thank the sponsors um, for shedding light, as I say, on the most important person you've never met. Um, I hope that this is the first of many, that uh, this will be a recurring event every four years. Uh, in Bennington County, uh, there could not be two candidates that are more diametrically opposed to each other. Uh, one clings to a decades-old philosophy uh, that was probably most popular in the 1980s, and one is looking uh, for a shift into the 21st century. Uh, this is the opportunity for the voters of Bennington County to make that shift, uh, to be the best that it can be, and I look forward to your vote uh, on August 14th. Thank you. This was not an easy process, so I'd like us all to show our appreciation for all of the candidates.
want to thank the ACLU of Vermont for suggesting this forum and for inviting the Center for Justice Reform to participate. Democracy requires transparency and an informed and educated electorate, and hopefully this, uh, this process helped uh, inform Vermonters about uh, the important choice for state's attorney. The ability to vote is both a gift and an obligation uh, to everyone out there. Please exercise your right to vote in the primary on August 14th and the general election on November 6th. To everyone who attended and to everyone who watched, uh, thank you so much and have a great evening.